We are going to go to our second well-steamed speaker, Rabbi Dr. Raphael Zarum. He's got a huge biography, as you know. Uh, he's a leading Jewish educator in the UK and teaches at conferences and seminars, synagogues, and Jewish community centers across the globe. He was ranked 20 states in the Jewish Chronicle Power 100 list of the most influential people in the UK Jewry. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here in this interfaith conversation with fellow scientists and religious leaders. And it's that combination that makes what we're doing here today so interesting. So I'm a rabbi and a doctor. Let me tell you a little bit, little, little bit about myself, and I'll tell you what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to tell you a bit about myself and about why these questions are important, a little bit about the history of the issue of religion and of science, and then, being a rabbi, I'm going to quote from the Bible, or the five books of Moses, the Torah, as we call it, which responds to these questions as I understand them. And I'll explain to you um, my way of looking at these things. So first of all, who am I? I was brought up a religious, orthodox Jew. I pray every day. I, I eat kosher food on the Sabbath for our Saturday. Um, I go to synagogue. I don't drive. I don't use electronics. I spend the day with my family, study, pray. I live a religious, traditional, orthodox Jewish life. But ever since I was a kid, I always loved science. And so I studied math, physics, and chemistry, and then I did a degree in math and physics at university, and then I did a PhD in theoretical physics, because I was fascinated by what it was all about. And you're absolutely right that Einstein had a difficulty with, um, with, uh, with quantum mechanics. He said, God doesn't play dice with the universe, and then I studied, quanta, uh, uh, I studied chaos theory, which says that not only does God play dice, but they're loaded. That's the next step, after we had relativity theory, and then quantum mechanics, then chaos theory. And these are very complex ideas, um, and I believe, by the way, that every educated person should know a bit about them. I've got to be honest with you. These questions are really important. You, you wouldn't call a person today educated if they didn't know basic literature, if they hadn't read Shakespeare or some of the great novels of the different cultures of the world, Russian novels and so on. In a similar way, an educated person knows the basics of what is science, what does relativity theory say, what is chaos theory, so we have a better understanding, and of biology as well, of, of what our world is. So these, these different areas are very important, which is why questions are so important. And when Pedgeman talked about exist existential questions, who are we, why are we here? My issue is that not, not enough of us even ask these questions. Not really. If we're brought up in a religious faith, we kind of accept it on faith. If we're brought up as atheists, then we don't want to go to a religious approach, necessarily. And we kind of continue in this direction. We might read a couple of books. It's very interesting if you sit someone down and ask them, where does your morality come from? Why do you choose what you do? Very quickly, it's from the gut. They won't quote many sources to you or many, they won't have thought much about it. It's a very interesting issue. So my sadness is not what are the existential questions, but why don't we ask them anymore? There's so much complexity in our world that we don't face these issues. So that's an, an open issue. Now, the issue of religion and science, it goes back to the very beginning. Human beings, ever since we've tried to work and survive on this earth, have had to deal with two or multiple approaches to solving our problems. We have the pragmatic scientific approach of how am I going to eat? How am I going to kill this animal in order to provide food for myself and for my family? How am I going to make shelter? These physical pragmatic problems were always there. And we always solve them using our brains scientifically, ultimately, to solve this, all the way from the very beginning to now. That's why you might have seen in the movie 2001, he moves from just throwing up the, uh, the bone that he hits with into a spaceship. That's the evolution of science, of solving our world in a physical way. But from the very beginning, and we know this from thousands of years ago, seeing drawings on cave walls in France and other places, people have always asked questions about who they are, what the meaning of being here is. And those questions, they've had different ways of solving them, through meditation, through reflection, through thought, through inspiration. And these two approaches have always gone hand in hand. And people used to understand the difference and know which one to use. When somebody was ill, they wouldn't just pray. 
they would also call the doctor. No matter how religious they were, they would call the doctor and try and find physical solutions for the pain this person was having. But they would also pray and they would also be with them in terms of relationship to support them and make them feel good. So these two approaches of scientific analysis and consciousness and morality and sense always went together. I think that's an important thing to appreciate. Things started going a bit awry, I would argue, in the 1800s. I mean, it goes earlier, 1700s philosophically, Spinoza and so on. But I think the 1800s was a real difficult time for religious people because scientific development and thought post uh, in, in modernity really leapt forward a lot, especially challenging the Bible. So for instance, people used to believe the world was a few thousand years old. That was a reasonable understanding. That's what the Bible said. They couldn't know any different. And that was standard, that was understood. And then, this is through Lyle, um, geology, the realization that maybe the world isn't thousands of years old, but actually through gradual decay, it's probably millions of years old. But the Bible didn't say that. So that was a problem. We're talking the mid-1800s. Another one, it's in the British Museum, we started finding alternative writings to the Bible which told similar stories. The Epic of Gilgamesh, another flood story. Suddenly the Bible wasn't exclusive and unique in its views. So that really challenged people as well. And then, and Darwin needed millions of years in order to have a solution for how evolution works through natural selection, Darwin writes his first book, Origin of Species, explaining the evolution of animals and plant life. He didn't do humans till 20 years later because he understood the religious sensibilities would be dangerous. So he took 20 years till he did that. But this is all in the 1800s. And I like to read how rabbis and priests in this country responded to those issues. It's very interesting. At first, there was a real nervousness and a rejection. Right, science is wrong, it's dangerous. Gradually, we've come to reconciliation and understanding. But it's, it's, I want you to appreciate how many things, and by the end of the 1800s, we have Freud at the very end, which makes things really complicated, because then there's no morality, there's just your conscious ego, which is doing this because of competing issues. So all of that goes out the window. Plus, biblical criticism. The Bible wasn't, the Torah wasn't the word of God. It's written by human beings of a different period. So 1800s was a real difficult time for people. And I think that's when science and religion started to go in different directions. I could give more examples, the birth of the novel as a way of solving issues, but, 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 but I'll stop there. So that's when those challenges began to happen. And then they started going different directions. And people started saying, well, a scientific answer is different to a religious answer. Right? And because we were addressing issues of where we came from through science, alternative solutions to what the Bible had always said, people then started getting worried and choosing one or the other. Right? So Victorian secularism and the challenges, the, the, uh, the tide of faith, they would quote, began to recede. And that was the problem. So, and we've come to the today where people talk a lot about religion and science today. And I think a lot of what is talked about is very banal, right? We, we simplistically talk about faith and believing in the ridiculous things, and then we talk about fundamentalist science as being only materialistic, and everybody poo-poos the other side. And it's just childish. It's just childish. If you look at it in historical context, we've always had these two ways of understanding the world, and we've always had a healthy relationship. It's not a competition, it's a partnership. It's a great partnership. Previous uh, chief rabbi in this country, Rabbi Sachs, wrote a book called The Great Partnership, trying to move religion and science debate forward. He says science takes things apart to see how they work, and religion puts things together to see what they mean. He's very good at these aphorisms. But the point I'm making is it's a partnership. It's not one or the other. It's the com com combination of the two. So given that, let me tell you as a rabbi, how I relate to those two and how the Torah, the Bible, the first book, Genesis, and the first few chapters, tells this story. So the story of Adam and Eve is told a number of times at the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter one has the seven days of creation, and then, well, into chapter two, and then chapter two retells the story again. And each version is slightly different. So there was a famous rabbi of the last century called Rabbi Soloveitchik, a very important American Orthodox rabbi, who said the two stories are to tell you two different ways of understanding our nature of being human. There is Adam 1 and Adam 2. 
And you, by the way, you don't have to choose which you are. We're all both. What's Adam one? He called Adam one majestic man. He's writing the 50s, so there were no women, by the way, obviously. So majestic humans is Adam one. And Adam two is covenantal humans. What's majestic humans? This is our ability, this is the scientific aspect, to conquer and control our world. Chapter 1 talks about the role of humans is to, is to um, manage the world and look after it and, and, and be involved in it and work with it. And Adam and Eve are created at the same time. Male and female, he created them at the same time. And they are both together fixing this world. The descriptions for man and woman in Hebrew in chapter 1 are zachar and nekeva, which literally means male and female, the biological definitions. Biological definitions of what those two things are, male and female, right? Literally, they, they fit into in, in, each other on a biological level. So when you have plugs in the wall, you'll talk about male and female, same in Hebrew. Zachar and nekeva, you want one plug to fit in the other. It's a biological relationship between these two. It's not about relationships and emotion. It's about the physicality of man and woman and able to dominate and control this world and be successful, right? To find medical solutions to problems, to fix our world, to give us shelter and to be healthy and all those kind of things. That's chapter one, majestic humans. Chapter two is covenantal humans. This is the relationship with God. In this version, it's not about dominating this earth and controlling it, it's about understanding it. So in this one, it's not male and female created at the same time, it's first one, then the other. And it's not male and then female, again that's a mistake. The word ha'adam means the human, it's not male or female. And then a part of it, a part of it is taken out and there's two parts. And one looks at the other and says, you are woman, and therefore I am man. The words man and woman come together in the verses, recognition of each other. Those words are not male and female, they're man and woman. In Hebrew, that's ish and isha, man and woman. And that's about relationship. In this story, they're looking at each other. And they understand who they are by looking at the other person. So this is about relationship. And in this one, God says to Adam and Eve, your job is to protect and look after this earth, not dominate it, but to look after it. It's a very different description. And that is a different kind of responsibility. That's a one of understanding a covenant. A covenant is a bond with the earth in which they're living in. Um, a, a great uh, Jewish philosopher, Martin Buber, talked about this in terms of the, his book, I and Thou. He, he said there's, there's two different ways of relating to other things in this world. There's I, it, and I, thou. Let's do it in terms of a tree. I can look at a tree as Adam 1 or as Adam 2. Adam 1 is I, it. Adam 2 is I, thou. Let me explain. Adam 1 looks at the tree and says, I can sit under this tree and I can cut off the branches and make myself a house. I can cut the, the wood, make paper out of it. I can burn it out of a bonfire and keep me warm. I can take the fruit from the tree and, and, and sustain myself. How can I use this object for my, for my benefit and for my needs and my control. That's Adam one. Adam two stands there and says, it's a beautiful tree. And I can appreciate something made in this world. I can smell it and, and value it. I can water and help it grow. I can see it as an independent existence that has a right to be here like myself and be part of this world, you see? So it's two ways of looking at the world, one control and domination, and one respect and covenant, right? I always think, by the way, and I always tell this when somebody writes a book, I always say to them, um, I tell them a story about the young man who wants to write his first book, and he's very excited, and he goes to his rabbi, because in my version it's a Jewish story, and he says, Rabbi, I've written a book about, about, about how to live, and the rabbi, will you look at it? And it's... So a few years ago, so he didn't write on a laptop. There's actually a, a manuscript, and he's got it unbound and holds it in front of the rabbi and says, will you read it? And the rabbi says, well, before I read it, let's go for a walk. And so they go for a walk into a forest, and they're walking through the forest, and the wind's flying, going through the trees, and the birds are singing, and the sun's coming through the, through the leaves, and they're enjoying this lovely walk. And at the end of the walk, and the, and the student's got his little masterpiece book in his, in his bag with him, the rabbi turns to him and he says, you know, if I read your book and I like it, and we publish it, we're gonna have to, we'll make a lot of books, 
And a forest like this will probably have to be cut down in order to make your book. So my question to you is not, is the book good, but is it better than the forest? And in my version of the story, they walk off together and his manuscript is left on a pile in the forest and the papers start flashing in the wind and the story ends. And that's the challenge of doing something. In other words, what two ways of understanding this world, Adam 1 and Adam 2. Adam 1 is majestic, control, I can make this world work for me. And many people are trying to be involved in progress and development, always working in this level. And so much of our television and, and what goes on in the world is work on this level. We don't do the second half, which is, are you good? Are you a decent person? You can do that, but should you do that? So genetic testing, all these moral scientific questions, we can do them, that's Adam 1, and that's interesting, but the separate question of should we, and when should we, and how should we, is Adam 2. Our responsibility to ourselves, to all other humans on this planet, to all life, and to God. That's Adam 2. That's the two ways of looking at this world. And again, it has to be complementary. It's a great partnership. Now, what I find interesting is, I, as I said, I love reading all these science books and about religion, and, and it, it, it all fascinates me. And I read a book by James Lefanu, I don't know if you've read it, called Why Us? It's a wonderful book about the development of science. And by the end of it, he says, you know, we still have three fundamental major questions in science that we haven't got answers to yet, even though we're trying to solve them. And what's really interesting, he says, is that the answers scientists are beginning to give are non-materialistic. In other words, physics, just as you say, is always about the physical material world that we live in. And that's why it seems not to have anything to say about faith. But what's interesting is as we develop science, it becomes non-material. So what does he say? The three big questions are, where does matter come from? Number two, where does life come from? How did it begin? And number three, what is consciousness or the mind? Right? And these have been three huge issues in science for a long, long time. Right? Now, difficult to answer. Darwin never tried to answer those first two questions of where does matter come from and where does life come from. His book is called The Origin of Species, not The Origin of Life. He writes in his diary very clearly, trying to work out how, where life came from is as impossible as trying to work out where matter came from. He said, you know, for him it was like, it's beyond. But we've begun through bombarding of atoms with our steady state theory and the Higgs boson to understand the nature of matter. We don't necessarily know how we got matter from non-matter. There's a possibility of quantum fluctuations from nothing, but I doubt if you know Krauss's approach that, that actually works. We have an idea of quantum fluctuations, but from nothingness, there's a, most scientists don't accept that's possible. We don't know how it came into being, but the nature of matter, we've done pretty well. In the last hundred years, development more and more of all the, of the different atoms and, and the different basic building blocks of existence of our physical world, we've discovered. And the reason why the Higgs boson discovery a few years ago was so important is it confirmed that our model, the standard model, was right. Now, for scientists, that was amazing. And my rabbi phoned me and he said, Rafi, go on the radio and tell them how amazing it is. I was like, they don't want to hear from a rabbi about this. He goes, no, but tell them. We've understood our world. That's a great achievement. That's a, it's a, it's a religiously a good thing as well. We're understanding how the world works. But if you know about the, 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 uh, the standard model, we've now got to the element of subatomic particles and quarks, which have aspects which aren't material, right? You can't actually touch them. You can trace where they've been or what they conceptually are. But what actually are they? And this is what Lefanu says in his book. We can't actually touch. So our solution to this big question is non-material even though science is the study of material objects. Do you follow that? It's a really interesting point he made. And the second one comes with the second question, what is life? So we thought, from the 70s and 80s, by working out the human genome and actually measuring an entire human being, right, and working out all the ob how, how their cells fit together, what the human genome is, if we could calculate the entire thing, then we'd know what life is. And guess what? We finished. We can do the human genome. You can get a book of each of you, the book of life. And yet, it still doesn't tell us what life is. And one of the best books you should read on the subject is by Schrodinger, What is Life? It's quite a short book, no equations, which is always good. 
Um, and, and, but it's interesting, even though we develop this understanding of the human genome and bio biolog biology, we still can't understand on a basic level what life is. So again, it's non-materialistic. We used to think that emotions and, and developments and even sexuality could be assigned to specific chromosomes. More complicated than that. It's just much more complicated than that. And it's non-physical again. A second realization that the final says, great point. And the third one is what is mind, what is consciousness. From the 70s, we could do brain scans. We could watch a thought as it appeared in your mind on the screen. And then we tried to work out which parts of the brain were working out what we're thinking. But again, it was too complicated. What is memory? <laughs> what is love? What is choice? We can't measure that, right? We have the very rudimentary um, uh, screens of the different parts of the brain, the, 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 the neurons firing, but any understanding of the relationship between the material motion of your brain and the process of thought that comes out, we haven't worked out. I'm not saying we never will, but we haven't, right? And I, I'm more positive. I think one day we might get there, right? But it's non-material. So Lafano points out brilliantly, I think you want to buy the, I don't get a commission, but you might want to buy the book. He's not Jewish. It's a, it's a great book. Why Us? It's called James Lafanu. Um, so he says, what's interesting is these three big questions which we're still challenged by. Where does matter come from? Where does life come from? What is mind? Or what is matter? What is life? What is mind? Our answers from a scientific point of view are becoming less and less material and conceptual. Which is fascinating. So I read that book and I put it down and I had a huge grin on my face because I'm a student of the Bible, of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 1, it talks about God making the universe, right? Which I believe. But what the text is and what it means is complicated. And I study in Hebrew, the original language. It's always best to do it in the original language, okay? It's, um, it's hard to study Shakespeare in French and really understand Shakespeare. So I study it in Hebrew. And there are different words used for God making the world. Vayas, he makes things. But three times, the word God creates is used, and God created. So in the first verse it says, in the beginning of the God creating the heaven and the earth. And then it says, he made this and he made that and he formed this. But the word creation, interestingly, only occurs three times. The first one, again, this is not a proof of science or anything. This is, as a religious person, responding to the science that I read. The first, the first time is in verse 1, as I told you. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the traditional Jewish commentators, Nachmanides, 12th century, says, this is creation ex nihilo, something from nothing. Right? Which I'm now, I'm now only very rudimentary beginning to understand early Christian thought and, the that, and, the, and these developments as well. I'm reading Karen Armstrong, who's brilliant. Um, but, and and other, all faith have begun to realize this, that God is essential, that the world is made something from nothing. Right? Which we can't do. We can make something out of something else. We can't make something from nothing. Right? That's responding to the first question is what is matter? Now it's not saying there will be no answer to it, but it's saying the, the Torah uses the word creation for that very complex idea. The second time it mentions the word create is referring to animals, specifically the fish, and God made the great sea creatures, the first animals, and the, the Bible story, the first animals that are made, the first um, animate life that is used, it uses the word creation again, which is our second question, what is life? So again, the word creation is used because for me, this is a quantum leap in development of reality. The first one is something from nothing, and the second one is life from non-life. We still can't do that. Right? We still can't do life from non-life. You know, in Frankenstein, we take other bits of, of life and try and zap it together. Or even we try and make life now, we're actually using other uh, broken down cells and rebuilding them. We're not doing life from non-life. That's the real question. Um, by the way, I'm a, I, think, I think Richard Dawkins always gets a mention in these, in these events. And I'm a big fan of his books, The Selfish Gene. You, it's a very important science. And I want him to be remembered, by the way, for his science rather than the religion science debate. We have to move things forward. But I read his book, The God Delusion, which is a great book for all religious people to read. It's, a, it's good to be challenged and have questions. Um, but I looked at that bit, what about life? Where did life come from? And he mentions that it is a good question, right? And we've managed to zap some basic amino acids in the laboratory and get some kind of development. But I'm sure we'll solve it, he says. And anyway, it did happen once, and that's it. There's nothing else in the book. It's one paragraph. I was like, but what about where life came from? You want to get into that issue? But he doesn't get into it. 
So it's an important question. And again, the second stage in Genesis is the creation of life. And the word vayivra, bara, which is to create, is used. And the third time is with humans, right? When it says that God created human beings in God's image. In the image of God. Again, and the rabbis have always understood the image of God to be consciousness. Not anything physical, because if, as, as you see in a boat board, if, if, God, if we're in the image of God and God is invisible, then why aren't we? <laughs> right? So the image of God is not anything physical, because anything physical would change and wouldn't be perfect. So the way we are like God is through our mind, through our consciousness, so a higher order existence. So again, you see, the three big questions we have in science are the three times that Genesis uses the word to create. Does that mean we'll never be able to do it? No. I don't think it means that. I think it means these are, we're now getting to the fundamentals. So what, maybe we'll get to it. I, I always imagine, from God's point of view, looking at us, us, you know, as a couple of billion bipeds on a black water planet at the far end of the Milky Way, and saying, wow, you've worked out really well. You've worked out how to survive and to control the Earth and the nature of physical reality. Well done, right? You've worked out the basics of what life is and what mind is, that's fantastic. Now you've got three more fundamental things to solve. What is your mind, what is life, and what is matter? And I believe God is egging us on. Doesn't, it's not afraid, but wants us to come up to understand these things. But that's my personal point of view. Okay, so those are the issues about these, these two worlds. And again, great scientists never had an issue. The thing got muddied because religious people started talking about science incorrectly, and scientists started talking about religion incorrectly. So let's do the religious people, okay? People started becoming fundamentalists. Now, I, I do like some aspects of fundamentalism, right? I, I like to put the fun back into fundamentalism, no? Okay, well, we'll see about that. I'm trying as well, it's a bit of humor. That's what we do. But, um, but what they do with fundamentalism and say, I have to, I, I can't, you know, evolution can't be right because it has to be God that did it. Right? And that's a, a, it's a rejectionist approach, and it's very problematic because you can't ignore what science says. There were rabbis in the ninth century, Sajiga On, who said, when you read the Bible, if the text doesn't make sense literally, then don't take it literally. And his example is brilliant. It says, in chapter 3, he says that uh, the w woman was called Eve, or in Hebrew, Chava, because she was the mother of all life, Em Kol Chai. So Sajid goes, she was the mother of all life. Does that mean she gave birth to antelope and sheep and insects? Well, obviously not. But it says the mother of all life, kol chai, which in Hebrew means all of life. But it obviously doesn't mean animals, it only means humans. So when you read a text, you have to know what it means in context and know when to be literal or when not. It's very subtle. So for instance, if I said to you, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Am I hungry? Physically, do I want to eat? You'd probably say yes. Do I actually want to eat a horse? Probably not. Having said that, the phrase, I am hungry, could be in a spiritual sense. Or not, I'm hungry to learn. I'm hungry to go to university. I'm hungry to understand. So hunger can be literal, right? Physical food, or it could be of ideas. Similarly, want to eat a horse? There are some countries <laughs> where people eat horses. So when I said to you, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse, you knew that the first half was literal and the second half wasn't, even though, in certain contexts, the first half could have been non-literal and the second half could have been literal. So how did you know? That's context. That's language. And that's the Bible. And through thousands of years of studying it, we've begun to understand what to take literal and what not to take. And Sajjah got on already 9th century said, if, you can't, if it doesn't make sense literally, then you can't take it literally. Now, the, the example of the flood. So there are rabbis that would say the Garden of Eden stories are literal, it's te teach you lessons. But the flood, this is an interesting one, and I'll finish in a few minutes because I'm running out of time. The, um, the flood, for instance, um, I'll do this very briefly. No rabbis ever said it wasn't literal. Right? Everybody always took the, the flood story literally. And it really upset me as a modern scientist because it's not possible. It's not possible 5,000 years ago, the entire earth covered in water, we'd have uh, results of it. Even though there's some great fundamentalist websites and you can see the, there's, there's, a, there's, a, <laughs> there's a museum in America where you actually can see the ark and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, um, so um, it's not possible. So, but why didn't Rabbi say that or anybody else? And I realized why. Because until the 1800s, 1900s, they thought it was possible. They only thought there were a few thousand species and they could fit. 
right? In the books of Josephus, you see people drawing pictures of how old animals could have fit. We only knew about thousands of species. We now know there are millions of species, and it's not possible. So then you kick in the approaches that say, if, it's not, if it challenges logic and science, then don't take it literally. It's not meant to be taken literally. And that's how you begin to understand how these texts work. So I think it's a very important issue to understand different ways of it. So the first point I made was that the um, religious people started um, rejecting science because they, uh, they ended up being fundamentalists because they felt it was being challenged. In a similar way, scientists started talking about religion, and that got problematic. The last line of Stephen Hawking's book, right, um, Brief History of Time, says, and if we know this, then we'll know the mind of God. Right? And when you start talking about God as a scientist, it starts getting worrying. So I, I like people to kind of respect different worlds or not know. Um, a, a great bar autobiography of Einstein is called Subtle is the Lord. It was written on the wall, and I think it's in Princeton, above the uh, fireplace in the math department. It's in German. I've forgotten what it is in German. It's not. But in, in English, it was a phrase that Einstein loved, which was, subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. Subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. In other words, this work, to understand the nature of reality is difficult. It's subtle. But God isn't malicious. In other words, it does make sense. And Einstein said, every scientist has a very deep faith that the world can make sense. Without that deep faith, you wouldn't do science. And therefore, science without faith is lame, and faith without science is blind. And that was Einstein's unification of those two. So to finish off, I don't get upset when people have challenges to religion or science. I get excited, because hopefully we'll deepen our understanding of both it's not about, I don't want this approach of like, oh, some rabbi or scientist answered it, made it all fit together, I can just go on with my life. No, you should be challenged by these issues. And through the interplay, we can understand the nature of what we are in a deeper way and get closer to ourselves and the world and to God. Thank you very much.